You may not know it by looking at me, but I'm a person who constantly has songs uh, running through my head. I'm often uh, humming tunes to myself and different uh, things will trigger different songs. For a lot of people, one of the ways I, I remember your name is I, I have a song that's associated with your name. I have songs that are associated with my, my grandchildren. And I, I say all that to you to say that um, this time of year, especially uh, in my, my trip to Africa now, a lot of Christmas carols were going through my head constantly every day. I woke up. I woke up singing them in my mind. I woke up. I, I went to bed thinking about them at night. I, 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 think out of all, I think out of all the church music, Christmas carols are my favorite. Um, you could literally just do a sermon just by reading Christmas carols. I could get up here and not add another word and just read uh, the lines of some of the ones we uh, heard this morning. The theology of salvation, the theology of Christ, of Scripture is, is so well preserved there. And uh, one of the th phrases that has been going through my head is this phrase, a thrill of hope, uh, the last few weeks. Anybody know what that is from? A holy night, that's right. I, I, I thought about, I sometimes obsess on words. Uh, if you go to the adult class, you know I'm really into words and, and their meanings. And, and this word thrill means uh, a sudden feeling of excitement and anticipation. We know that hope from the scripture means not a wish or a desire, but in the Bible, the word hope means a confident expectation of the fulfillment of future events because of what God has done in the past. In other words, in the Bible, faith looks back at what God has done. We know that he's faithful. He's kept every promise he's ever made. Hope is faith looking forward. We know that God is going to do what he said he's going to do in the future because of what he has done in the past. And so hope is not a cross your fingers. Uh, I, I, there's two kinds of hope, right? The world's hope is you cross your fingers and you wish or you desire that something good might happen. But for the believer who trusts and believes in God's word, we have a confident expectation that God is going to do what he said he was going to do. And so I, I've been thinking while I was in Africa about uh, this thrill of hope that we have at this time of year that the believer has. And I decided to talk on that this morning. What what is so thrilling about this hope this time of year, Christmas Eve? We are on the brink of Christmas Day, the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. Speaking about the birth of Jesus, a couple hundred years before he was born, Isaiah, in one of the great Messianic passages, said this in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, or a child is going to be born for us. To us a son is given... And the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his names will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And it's that Prince of Peace that I think gives us mostly that, that thrill of hope. On the night of Jesus' birth, when the fulfillment of what Isaiah had written, we read this in, in Luke chapter 2. Um, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. They're gathering when Quirinius was governor of um, Syria. They sent out a thing like, hey, we want to tax you all and we got to do a census. We got to do a, a population survey. So everybody had to go to the hometown of their ancestors. So verse 3, all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. We, we see here even uh, one of the things that gives us peace and gives us hope is that God is in control of everything, right? What did he do? He used a pagan, a pagan ruler to get Mary and Joseph where they needed to be so that scripture would be fulfilled. Because years before, Micah had said, it's in Bethlehem that the Messiah, that the Savior of the world 
is going to come and going to make his appearance. It's interesting, even though the scripture said that, nobody really paid a lot of attention. You'd think you would keep your eye on Bethlehem all the time. Who's born in Bethlehem or who's come to Bethlehem? Well, you know, this is the city, right? But Bethlehem, for those of you that are local, Bethlehem's like the cataract of that area, right? It is a, yeah, you guys, you guys know where I live. I live in an unincorporated, I, I live in cataract. I can't even have a cataract address. It's so small, my address is actually Sparta, even though I live in cataract. That was Bethlehem in its day. It was not a big city, you know. People are expecting to hear, oh, the Messiah is going to come from New York. He's going to come from Los Angeles. He's going to come from Jerusalem. He's going to come from some big important city. But God said, no. He goes, the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem. So it took a little sense. There's no reason to go to Cataract unless you're coming to see me or you know somebody else. There's no other reason to go there. And in a similar way, you don't just go to Bethlehem unless there was some reason. So God, in His fulfillment, all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is planned out. And so God said, the, the Messiah is going to be born. I don't care where they're living. I will get them to where they need to be to fulfill Micah's prophecy and the Scripture. I just want you to just marvel. That's not even the sermon, but just to marvel in that God is in control of even the tiniest what we would consider insignificant details. And God goes, no, it's all exactly as I've planned it. So, verse 6, And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. That manger is a feed trough, laid him in the, in the feed bin. Now, in the same region... There were shepherds out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great joy. Is that right? Anybody, did I read that correctly? I see people shaking their heads. Good, I'm just making sure, making sure you guys didn't get careless while I was gone. You're still people of the word. They weren't filled with joy. They were filled with what? Fear. That's a little bit terrifying, right? All of a sudden, a supernatural. You're out in the fields. It's dark. You're just chilling, just making sure no lions or bears or something are coming to steal your sheep or no thief is coming. So you're keeping watch over your flocks by night. Suddenly, the sky lights up. And the scripture says it's, it's not just light. It says it's the glory of the Lord shown all around them. Do, do you know what happens when sinful people come in contact with the glory of the Lord? We get fearful. Do you know why? Because our sinfulness is reflected back upon us and magnified. Do you remember when Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord when he went up on Mount Sinai and he was in the presence of the Lord? And he didn't even realize what was happening. The scripture said that he came down from the mountain to talk to the people. And the glory of the Lord reflected off his face. Not the Lord's full glory, just a reflection of the Lord's glory. And the people said, we can't look at you. They said, you need to cover your head with a bag. They said, you need to because if we see God's glory, we are a sinful and wretched people. I understand why the shepherds were afraid. They, they weren't afraid because they were startled. They were like, we are in the presence of God. We're in the presence of holiness here as uh, poor sinners. And so the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not. I, I don't know if you noticed this, Christian, but look at how many times in the scripture when Jesus appears, when an angel appears, the very first words out of their mouth every time are almost the same every time. Fear not. Do you know why that is? Because we're a fearful people, aren't we? We are a fearful. It's what we're going to talk about this morning. So the angel of the Lord said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this is going to be the sign for you. 
You will find that baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, as if that wasn't terrifying enough, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. My, my family celebrates, uh, my immediate family, we celebrate our Christmas together last night which the Norwegians like to call Lilla Yula often, Little Christmas Eve. And we do that, we started that years ago, just because in ministry, I'm often working on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. So we took a time where we could celebrate without other things going on. And I always, re- we have a star book and I read the Christmas story to my grandchildren. They gather around, it's kind of a pop-up book. So when you open the page, it becomes 3D. And when I read the, when I read the uh, page, about suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. One of my older granddaughters looked at that picture of the angels in the sky and she counted and she said, Grandpa, it's the angel and three other angels. That doesn't seem like a multitude. <laughs> I said, yeah, it's not. I said, that's just a picture, picture in the book here. But I, we don't know what a multitude is. The writer's telling us, ah, we couldn't even count. The the skies were filled with the angelic beings singing glory to God. Those first Christmas carols, really, whatever they were singing there. And one of the things that they were singing and saying is, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. We're going to talk about peace this morning because I think... The thrill of hope that we get at this time of year is that there is hope that we can experience peace. We'll talk a little bit later, what does it mean with those whom he is pleased. One of the things that we do sometimes is that this this promise of peace is a universal offer of peace, but it's not a universal declaration of peace. It's not peace for all men. It's not peace for all people everywhere. It's peace for those with whom God is pleased, the Scripture says. And we'll, we'll talk about that at the end, exactly what that means. But as I thought about this thrill of hope as the song was going through my head for the last three weeks, a thrill of hope. A weary heart rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. It was Christmas Eve, and the Christmas carol writer is saying, Tomorrow, tomorrow, the hope comes. I don't know what your year has been like. I think we're a week away from this year being done, or somewhere around that time. You may have had a bad year. You may have had a fantastic year. But no matter how 2023 has gone for you, it's ending. And even if it's been great, you're probably tired. You might be worn out physically, you might be worn out spiritually, maybe mentally, but the message of God on Christmas Eve is a message of hope. It's a message of hope, the thrill of hope that peace is available for those with whom God is pleased. There's hope. God doesn't want you to go through another year without experiencing the peace that the birth of Jesus brings. I think we could all agree, no matter how our year has gone, we'd, we'd like to see peace in this world, wouldn't we? It's a little exhausting. It seems, like, it seems like, even if we think in terms of earthly conflict, I don't know how long the Russia-Ukraine war thing is going, but I know it's been years. There seems to be no end in sight to that. Now we have uh, the conflict in the Middle East. Uh, There's conflicts that we're not even aware of. I was not able to go into the DRC this time because there are roving bands of rebels that make it unsafe for, for an American to go to that country. And so the people of Congo are longing for peace that I could come again next time to visit the widows and orphans. I haven't been able to see them in person for a couple years. And it's not just peace of the conflict, it's peace in our own lives, amen? Some are longing for peace in their marriage. Some are longing for peace between a parent and a child or a grandparent and a grandchild. Some are longing for peace with, with their neighbor. I think I've told you before in, in, in Cataract, if you ever come to visit me, I'll, I'll drive you over there and show it to you. Hopefully they're not 
listening to the live stream here, but I have a couple of neighbors not too far away from where I live who, who literally, um, the only thing that is between their, their properties is the driveway. So their, their properties touch, but the locals told me for whatever reason, um, they haven't gotten along in forever. So there's this little, there's this little wire fence that goes between. It does nothing. It doesn't connect on either end. It's just they've literally put up a fence to say, we are not close. We are not neighbors. We have this barrier. Of se- it's, it's really kind of hilarious because it's meaningless other than to say, don't ever forget I don't like you and you don't like me. Whatever disagreement we've had. We long, we, we long for peace. We long for peace of mind to know that, that God is in control and everything is going to be okay. Peace is such a, a universal desire in our lives that we recognize when some extraordinary things happen in our world when it comes to peace. Are, are any of you here familiar with a very important thing that happened in history called the Christmas Truce of 1914. It was in the middle of World War I where an event took place that is still talked about today. In, in World War I, which was known as the First World War, in fact, they didn't call it World War I because nobody knew that there was going to be a World War II. It was called the War to End All Wars. It was so bad and so global that they went, it's never going to be anything like this again, right? In that time, the the typical way you fight was called trench warfare. So what you did was you dug a ditch as close to the enemy as you could get and still be safe, and then the enemy dug a ditch as close, and and then you fired back and forth across the trenches, if somebody was foolish enough to lift their head or you tried to lob a grenade or bombs into that to kill people. On Christmas Eve of 1914, uh, by a place called P- Piergen, I can't say it very well, on the front in the trenches, a very strange thing happened on Christmas Eve. The German forces began to light little torches and they put them on sticks and they held them up out of their trenches and the German forces began to s- sing Still Nacht, which in German is Silent Night. And they began to sing this song and at first the, the British forces and the other trench, uh, they started singing uh, beer songs. They started singing bar songs, fight songs, but the Germans just kept singing Silent Night and this Christmas carol. To After a little while, it had an impact on the British forces and they grew quiet and they began to sing Silent Night in English. And there was a holy kind of a calm, they say, that, that settled over the front to the point that the next day when the sun came out, they kind of waved some some flags like, could we, was this a real deal last night? Like, could we come out and talk to you and you talk to us? And they, both sides agreed, yeah, let's do that. And so they came out and they met in no man's land on Christmas Day. You can go on YouTube, you can see stories of survivors, well, they're all gone now, but those who survived and talk about it, they exchanged cigarettes, they gave each other cigarettes as gift, they exchanged some other things, and one of the funniest things that actually happened is they played a game of football slash soccer in no man's land on Christmas Day. They took a couple of rifles to make a goal on either end in an impromptu game of football, and, and Christmas celebration broke out between the German forces and the British forces that day. And then the next day, the day after Christmas, it goes back to, now we got to kill each other again. The commanders of both armies were so concerned about this when word spread about the Christmas truce that happened on 1914 on Christmas Day. They forbid the armies. They said, you cannot do this. There will be no truces. We fight to the death. We fight to the end. It's, it's a little known thing, but there were actually several other truces, smaller ones that happened after that in different places, not on Christmas Day, where the people said, forget that. We're tired of the killing. We're tired of the war. We just want to get back to normal life. 
I understand that. Most of us are not physically trying to kill someone or not physically in the place of, of danger of dying, but we long for peace. War and conflict is exhausting. As we head into 2024, God wants to answer that prayer to give us peace. And as we look at the Word of God, there's actually three kinds of peace that the Scripture talks about that I would like to touch on briefly this morning. When we think of that thrill of hope, the peace on earth for those with whom God is pleased, that I'm, I'm going to do these kinds of peace out of order. The most important piece I'm going to talk about last. So understand that when I talk about the first piece and the second piece, it's only possible with the third piece, okay? So hang with me. The first kind of peace that God offers to us is, is peace with others. It's a relational peace. It's peace be between uh, mankind. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16, Together as one body, Christ has reconciled both groups to God by means of His death on the cross, and our hostility towards each other was put to death. If you look in some translations, it's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. It's talking about the covenant people and, and the Gentiles, or as the Bible would say, pagans. And God says, through his death on the cross, Jesus became the reconciler. In Christ, there is no what? There is no Jew or Greek. There is no Jew or Gentile. There is no male or female. There is no rich or poor. In Christ, there is only his children. And, and so for us as God's children, in order to have peace with others, in order to have inner inner interrelational peace, we, we have to have this mindset. Everyone in this world is either my brother and sister in Christ, they're either already part of the same family of God that I am of, and if they're of the same family, why are we letting anything affect that relationship? I will tell you one of the hardest things that I, is, is trouble for me to understand as a pastor is when I see families that have broken relationships. I just experienced that when I was in Africa with, with someone who passed away and they're like, they hadn't talked to their mom in eight years and now it's too late. And I said, I don't understand that. How do we not understand that life, whatever the issue is, someone has to be forgiving, someone has to be gracious to, to do whatever you can. And I'm saying to you, Christian, if you're a believer here, do whatever you can to make peace with those in your life who don't want peace to you. You can't make the peace, but you can do everything you can do to make sure that you're not the one who is the cause of their not being peace. Amen? Whether or not they respond, that's up to them. But you need to do everything you can by God's grace to seek to have peace. It doesn't mean you'll agree. I had, uh, it, it happens when I go over to Africa a lot that I get asked a lot of questions because I've been pastor for a long time and one young lady was asking me advice on a situation where um, she was wronged. Uh, it, it's two people from the same church. Uh, the other person lied to her. The other person defrauded her. Um, in, in human terms, she was, she, she was in the right, and now there's no, no fellowship between them. When they see each other at church, they turn, and they walk, and they go the other way. And, and she said, I'm, I'm embarrassed because, she said, I, I got mad at this other lady, and I called her and said, what you're doing is not right, it's wrong, I should, I should call the police, you've stolen money from me, you've done this. She goes, I, I, I let my frustration show through. And she said, what should I do? And I said, you should go to her and apologize and ask for her forgiveness. And she said, what? She said, people are telling me to sue her. People are telling me this and that. And I said, yeah, but that's not what God is telling you. I said, what does God say? He says, when someone takes advantage of you, turn the other cheek. If someone does this, you... I, I said, here's what I would do if I was you. I said, the next time you see her in church, and I said, it may be tough. She may be scared. But I would approach her and say, I am so sorry that I, I got upset with you. I'm so, that, that's not Christ-like between sisters in Christ that we act like this. I said, you, you, 
you don't you deal with what you did wrong you can't deal with what she did wrong and i said you may be surprised that the holy spirit may use that to bring your sister back into relationship with you because she knows what she did wrong she knows everything she did wrong. but you know what she's thinking right now ah she got mad at me so i'm justified she got upset, so now we're equal, now we're the same. I said, make peace with your sister. And even if she rejects you, and even if she walks away, you have done what you could do to create peace. I said, because that's what Jesus did with us. We were the, defend we were the offenders, we were the ones that were in the wrong, but we didn't reach out to Christ and say, hey, can we make it right? Can we restore peace? The one who was sinned against is the one who reached out. I said, nothing can be more Christ-like than the one who has been sinned against reaches out and says, can we have peace between us? God offers interracial, inter relational peace between us maybe it's between you and your spouse or you and your children or neighbor or, or maybe even a, a fellow church member the only way that we can have lasting peace with others is when we are united as children of God the second kind of peace that the life of Christ offers to us that the babe in the manger offers to us is peace within uh, it, it's emotional peace in the Bible it's called the the peace of God I think in non-spiritual terms, we call it peace of mind. I will be honest with you, this is the peace that I struggle with the most. This is the peace that I struggle with the most, asking God to, to work it in my life. I'm, I'm pretty good. I, I get along well with people. I don't have much problems with, with, with uh, relationships. But peace of mind, Colossians 3.15 says this, Let the peace of God or the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Wow. I get convicted by that one. Let the peace of mind that Christ gives rule in your hearts. I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit next Sunday when I share with you on my trip. I had overall a phenomenal trip. God was just working and God was doing things. But in the middle of that trip, on a night where I was out celebrating with friends, I got a phone call that just totally robbed me of my peace of mind. My, my evening was ruined because I was like, oh no, how do I solve this? How is this going to work out? What's going to happen? So much so that I, I, I called my wife and I called my brother and I texted some other Christian friends. I knew what they were going to say, but I needed to hear it, right? And somebody, somebody texted me and they said, well, I'm just going to tell you what you always tell me. And I said, that's why I'm texting you. Yes, I know the answer, but I need to be reminded of that, amen, from brothers and sisters in Christ and others who say God is in control. You need to cast your cares upon Him. You need to have this, this peace that only God can give. The peace that the Bible says is what kind of peace? It goes beyond all our human comprehension. It literally means it's peace, not because the problem has gone away or not because the problem is solved. It's the problem is there. It's ginormous. It's beyond our ability to solve or figure out. But we go, hmm, but God is in control. And God says that he's going to take care of this. So I'm going to have peace, not because of the solution, but because of the one who is in control. Amen. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. By the way, uh, I think this is probably a piece that a lot of us need or struggle with in our life because there's more than 790 verses about the peace of God in Scripture. But the most important piece, the most important piece from which the other two flow is peace with God. Amen? You, 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 you can have a temporary truce with others and interrelational conflicts, you can have a temporary uh, reprieve uh, of peace of mind, but you will never truly have peace with others. You will never truly have peace of mind unless you first have peace with God. And that's what the baby in the manger is all about. Peace with God, this spiritual peace, affects everything else. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.18, God sent Christ to make peace between himself and us. That's in the contemporary English version. God sent Christ to make peace between himself and us. Go back to those shepherds in that field for a moment. 
I want you to think about uh, my my uh, my my family is uh, it's a lot of fun, and the more grandkids I get, the more creative people are getting in birth announcements and announcing the arrival of a new grandchild. Uh, one was announced uh, number. I've been telling you that I'm going to have 19 by the end of February. I'm going to have 20 by this summer. And the, and the way the newest baby was announced is uh, we send these little videos to each other. And uh, the, the one family who lives in the city sent a video saying, next week, only six more days till we're in Wisconsin. We can't wait. And we're going to be together six more days in Wisconsin. And I sent a picture of them sitting, sitting at my hotel, relaxing. It was the day before I came home, relaxing by the pool, getting ready to get on a plane the next night. And I said, here's what grandpa's doing and can't wait to see you guys. Well, then one of my granddaughters, uh, so sharp, saw the background of the video they made and counted the Christmas stockings. And she said, there's too many Christmas stockings. So she came on the video. Actually, her sister, she she didn't want to do it. Her sister came on the video and said, I counted the Christmas stockings. There's one too many. Is that for your pet? Or are you trying to tell us there's a baby coming? And they said, there's a baby coming. That's a thrill of hope. Grandpa's like, yay, I missed that. I I missed the forest for the trees. For 400 years, the people of God had been waiting for the Messiah. They didn't know it was going to be a baby. They thought it was going to come as a full-grown, conquering king, but they knew the Messiah was coming. The promise was coming of the Prince of Peace, of the Counselor. It said that he was going to be in Bethlehem. But for 400 years, nothing, no birth announcements, nothing. And when the birth came, it wasn't like, hey, the baby's coming. It was like, the baby is here. Book it to Bethlehem. The long-awaited Savior is here. And it says the shepherds ran with haste. They go, we, we got to see this. I can understand that. The baby was here because that baby was the thrill of hope. Peace isn't an unattainable dream. It's a free gift from God. God doesn't want us to live disconnected from Him. Peace with God is never going to come from something we do. Peace with God comes from what Christ did for us on the cross because He first came to Bethlehem to live a perfect life for us. God wants to give you that important peace this Christmas season. This Christmas, as we sing and talk about peace on earth, Know that God ultimately wants to give you real and everlasting peace. Peace with Him, peace with others, and peace of mind. Has the birth of Christ changed your life? Has His life continued to change your life? As His presence among us by God's Holy Spirit transforms us as individuals, as a church, as a community, that he brings us the peace, the Prince of Peace. Amen? Father, thank you for this reminder today. Some, sometimes we get caught up in the birth. We, we all love babies. I think everybody loves babies. Uh, it's exciting. And Father, to know that this baby was given for us exactly what we needed at the exact right time to bring peace between God and men, peace between man and man, and to bring that inner peace that goes beyond comprehension. Father, thank you for this gift. May we never lose sight of that, of what ultimately this thrill of hope that you have given to us. A baby is born unto you, a Savior, Christ the Lord. Amen.